the Sun Panel is a very special program for us, as you know. Uh, we'd like to thank especially uh, uh, Ms. Thomas for this evening's uh, arrangements. And uh, as a matter of uh, continuity and the rem rem reminder, in a way, of how great institutions uh, stretch out across time, uh, we thank Joe Stern also, who for 17 years chaired this panel. And uh, who preceded Ms. Thomas in, in the position of editor of the editorial page. Um, in terms of the great traditions of a paper, we'd also like to uh, pay our respects and memory to uh, two of the members of the uh, Baltimore Sun who died this past year and who were wonderful members of the council, uh, Brad Jacobs, who for many years was editor of the editorial page of the Evening Sun, who was on our founding board of trustees, uh, served as our chairman for uh, four years, and on the board for nearly the entire uh, length of the history of this council. And Don Patterson, who of course was publisher of the Sun and uh, president of the A.S. Able Company, uh, who also was chairman of our board for four years. Um, so we do pay our respects to their, their memory, certainly, and we're reminded as Baltimoreans of how institutions have a way of uh, uh, enforcing and perpetuating the life of a city, and uh, uh, the sun certainly is of that, that kind. Uh, so we have a new panel tonight. Uh, in the tradition of our fine panels of the past, we thank Dan Berger in particular uh, for arranging the panel tonight. Dan will introduce the panel to you. Uh, let me very briefly introduce Dan to you, although you're, uh, you, all of you know him. Uh, he's an experienced newspaper man, uh, Oberlin College graduate, Neiman Fellow at Harvard, uh, did a lot of legwork on papers starting at age 16 with the New York Daily News. Uh, did work with two uh, former newspapers, the, Cle the uh, Daily Press, uh, the Press and uh, Free Press in Cleveland, and the New York Herald Tribune. Uh, Dan joined the editorial page of the Evening Sun, I believe, in 67. He um, served as the London representative of the, or correspondent of the council for a couple of years, joined the editorial page of the Sun in 1973. Uh, where he's covered almost everything. At the present time, he's primarily dealing with foreign affairs uh, with some treatment of cultural matters in Baltimore as well. So it gives me a great deal of pleasure to present to you Mr. Dan Berger. Thank you, Dr. Bird, and thank you for having us. Uh, you talk about the value of this panel to the council. I think I've sat at the last 17 of them, and I think they're of immense value to the sun. Uh, other people, I think, may come for the, uh, the answers. I come to all the meetings to listen to the questions. Uh, rarely does the newspaper have a chance to interact with a very high quality segment of its readership this way, and newspapers talk a lot and spend a lot of money having focus groups. And I don't know any group that's this large, this important, and this focused. And we really learn a lot being here and trying to, to grapple with you. Uh, uh, our publisher, Michael E. Waller, uh, I think understands the importance of this event, which would have been his first. and he has a family event he couldn't get out of, and he asked me to convey his regrets for not being here. As you know, Joe Stern created this panel. He used his cloud in the paper to create it. He ran it. He was part of it every year. Uh, this is an act that cannot be followed. Uh, these are shoes that cannot be filled. So someone said, OK, Berger, you do it. So I said, OK, I need more troops. And uh, I'm very happy that John Carroll, the editor, uh, saw fit that I have them. And all these people work for him. They all should be writing and editing tonight. And he made them available. And in particular, 
He used some budget and at some inconvenience to make two foreign correspondents available who were home on leave and delayed their departure to their beach so they could be here tonight. So this is what we're going to do. I have asked G. Jefferson Price III, the foreign editor, to tell us about the world's hot spots. Then I've asked Mark Matthews, the diplomatic correspondent, and our one uh, embodiment of continuity with panels past, to talk about what the government is doing about it and whether Congress lets it. And then I've asked Tom Bowman, the defense correspondent, to say what foreign policy problems the Pentagon is planning to handle or th has been told to expect or is uh, hoping to deal with. Uh, Kathy Lally, our Moscow correspondent, will tell us what kind of country Russia is becoming. Frank Langford, our Beijing correspondent, will do the same for China. And then if there's time, I I'll talk a little bit about uh, economic events uh, in Asia, perhaps in Europe. Um, <coughs> the foreign editor um, bosses these other people around. He tells them what they should be reporting. He decides what goes in the paper. He advocates more resources and more space in the competition for those things among the editors. And he's supposed to plan ahead. And that makes him a forecaster whether he wants to be or not. Jeff Price uh, has spent a decade of his life as a foreign correspondent. He was in Hong Kong for the Associated Press in the late 1960s. He came to the Sun after that. He was our uh, Middle East correspondent in Beirut in the 70s. And then he was our Middle East correspondent in Jerusalem for half of the 1980s. Then he came back. He has been a uh, foreign editor since 1991, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, a good long time. Uh, Jeff Price. Thank you. Well, I can't tell you how much it pleases me to be uh, surrounded by. Can you hear me? You can't hear me. Can you hear me now? OK. Well, let me start that again, because it's the funny line in the speech. <laughs> <laughs> but I was going to say that I uh, was really pleased to be surrounded by so many people who probably did not think that the most important story in the world last year was the death and funeral of Princess Diana of Wales. <laughs> and uh, although I must say that we, uh, um, devoted probably more people, manpower, and resources to that event uh, than we have to any other event since the Gulf War, which was probably more important. Um, in fact, uh, unfortunately, it took the death in the middle of this uh, celebration, or not a celebration really, but celebration of Diana's life, the death of Mother Teresa in the middle of it all to sort of bring us back to the real world uh, in as much as she was, with all due respect to the Princess of Wales, uh, far closer to sainthood than some people were elevating the princess to. Um, Dan uh, asked me to talk about some of the hot spots of last year and some of the places which I think will be hot spots in the next year. And um, when you're talking about hotspots, you're necessarily, at least by our definition, talking about uh, places uh, that are generally unhappy. The unhappier they are, the hotter they are, and the more likely we are to send a reporter there. Uh, it's almost as if our motto was, good news is no news. 
So before um, I do talk about those places, I would just like to make a general observation that I do believe um, that in the real world last year, the good news outweighed the bad news, um, setting aside perhaps the last couple of months in Asia. And the dividends of the end of the Cold War continued with growing prosperity for more of the world. We passed another year without any real threat of a real war between real countries. This is a good sign, I think. The hot spots of 1996 were essentially the same as the hot spots of 1997 and probably will be this year and through the end of this century, which is not obviously too long from now. Um, I'm not going to really try to get into any great detail uh, in these places that we have covered this year and expect to cover next year. I thought I would touch down on them and uh, perhaps we could return to the ones that uh, interest the people who come up with questions. Can you all hear me? I hear, I see, you can't? Well, that's not my fault. <laughs> we should close the kitchen door. Pardon, closer to the mic? All right, this is it. All right. Closer to the mic. Here I am. I'm as close as I can get to this mic. I talked to Don Schaefer before coming up here, and he didn't tell me about this problem. Um, in any case, for those of you who may not have heard me say this, uh, I'm not going to even try to get into great detail on, on these places that I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to touch down on them very, very briefly. And I thought that the ones which interest you most, uh, we could talk about in greater detail during the Q&A period. Uh, and I was also saying that the hot spots of 1996, if I can go back to where I was, <laughs> were essentially the same as 1997, and they're probably going to be the same ones through the rest of the century. Um, the one hot spot which uh, I'm most familiar with and which uh, has certainly uh, in the last year, in the last decade, uh, taken up more of our attention than just about any other one in the world is the Middle East. Um, the confrontation, uh, I'll deal with a few things here in, in, in that region uh, very briefly. The confrontation with Iraq um, continued. It's sort of history's most dangerous game of hide and seek. Uh, the game is continuing right now, and I suspect it will continue through this year and probably, uh, in, to some extent, um, not very happily as long as Saddam Hussein is still alive. Uh, one of the things that some people, not many in this room probably, lose sight of is that the problem could be far more dangerous uh, if we had to deal with someone other, someone less predictable, perhaps, than Saddam Hussein. And there's Iran. We and the Iranians continued to hate each other throughout last year. Um, then, right after the Islamic conference in uh, Tehran a couple of months ago, uh, President Khatami of Iran uh, held a press conference with the foreign press. Uh, who, then there were more people from the foreign press corps in the Middle East invited to attend that conference than, uh, than Iran normally invites into the country. I think that was a sign that something, uh, that he had something to say. He did, he uh, made some conciliatory statements about the relationship between his country and ours. Uh, and uh, then he followed that up with a, an interview on CNN um, about a week ago, I believe, was that a week ago? And uh, said more or less the same things. Uh, I, I think that he, uh, not unlike our own president, operates under some, in some difficult political circumstances, and he was somewhat inhibited in what he had to say about a rapprochement. But I do believe that in the coming year, there probably will be some sort of a rapprochement with the Iranians. Um, I also believe, frankly, um, that there are good reasons for this to happen. 
Uh, for one thing, speaking of the Iraqis, if we were to start getting along better with the Iranians, uh, I think it probably would have some effect in even further isolating Saddam Hussein as the region's worst bad boy. Now there's the so-called Middle East peace process, and I have to confess that people in our business are sort of running out of adjectives to, to describe the sorry state of that process. Um, troubled, moribund, fraying, um, dormant, non-existent. Uh, it, it has been a very, very troubled process, and I'm, I'm afraid that none of the, as I'm sure you all know, none of the optimism that swelled up after the Oslo Accords seems to be left. The reason the Oslo Accords came about is because there was, or there were, people in charge on both sides who wanted to make it happen. And there was at least one person who not only wanted to make it happen, but could make it happen, and he was Yitzhak Rabin. Now, at the risk of provoking some people in this room, uh, we have an Israeli prime minister who could make it happen, but doesn't want to entirely. We have a Palestinian leader who may want to make it happen, but who either will not or cannot. Whenever the prime minister of Israel loosens up, something bad happens, and you end up with a reactionary policy. <coughs> Whenever Arafat seems to be moving closer to the goal, the posts get moved. This year is the 50th anniversary of the birth of Israel. I predict that the year will not be a great one for the peace process. The Palestinians probably will go ahead and declare a state. This will cause an unhappy, to say the least, reaction from the Israeli side. I think there probably will be more terrorism, because I don't think that either side can really completely control it. And I think the goalposts will keep moving, and the area will remain a hot spot. And we will certainly keep a bureau there. <laughs> It'll probably be the last one we ever close. Now, touching briefly into some other places, there are other so-called hot spots. Africa was one in the last year. Uh, Laurent Kabila's road to victory in Congo was a bloody one, but there was some hope that once the Congo conflict was over, the genocidal conflict in Central Africa, especially in Rwanda, Burundi, and in Congo, would begin to close. Now, lately, unfortunately, there have been strong signs that this is not happening, and in fact, there have been at least two rather large massacres reported. Uh, I'd be happy to talk about Bosnia later, but frankly, it's been, uh, relatively speaking, a fairly quiet year there. It could have been a hot spot if the U.S. trips had left in June, but now no one will say when they're going to leave. Closer to home, Cuba could develop into an even more interesting story this year if Castro shows any signs of opening up. And uh, perhaps there will be a sign of that after the Pope's visit. Haiti could be trouble again. Our troops pulled out long ago. The UN is out. A lot of problems that led to the invasion there three years ago still exist. They're getting worse in some ways. They're the same problems that sent the refugees our way from Haiti before and essentially gave us the greatest incentive to go into the place. I fear that it may start all over again, especially after next year when the elections um, take place again. Now, I've left the Asian turmoil to last because it's a good segue to Dan Berger, who I think is eventually going to talk about the economic side of things. I think we've only seen some fairly mild signs of the sort of upheaval, social upheaval, that these uh, market collapses could cause. and that stability, uh, everything we can do to restore stability to those markets uh, is probably very much in our own best interests. Thank you.
Mark Matthews came to the Sun in 1980 and went to our Washington Bureau two years later. He has covered the State Department since 1990 and is one of the handful of really knowledgeable diplomatic correspondents in Washington. And he's known to most of you because he's been on the last several of these panels. Mark? Thank you, Dan. Uh, there's uh, the most recent cover of, can everybody hear me? The, mo the most recent cover of Foreign Policy Magazine uh, shows President Clinton standing before the National Symphony waving a baton and the, and the caption next to his picture asks, why won't the world play along? One reason the world won't play along is that this picture is slightly wrong. Instead of a delicate baton, what the world most often sees when they think of the United States is a blunt instrument, an instrument of, of political, economic, legal, and at times military power. And the face that they attach to that, as much as President Clinton, is Jesse Helms. And that really, I, I think, gets to the difficulty that, that Washington is, is having in, in projecting a consistent foreign policy uh, 10 years, almost a decade, after the end of, of the Cold War. There's, there's still a stalemate bet, uh, between the two ends of Pennsylvania Avenue when it comes to making and implementing foreign policy. At the White House, things have started to look a lot better from the standpoint of leaders, other leaders around the world. President Clinton is seen as increasingly sure-footed, and he has picked some uh, people who are recognized as, as competent. Madeleine Albright is uh, widely praised for her directness without uh, being so direct that she makes enemies in the wrong places. Robert Rubin, until the, uh, the most, uh, until the uh, Asia crisis, was seen as a, as a very uh, steady hand at the, at the Treasury Department. The National Security Council is directed by Sandy Berger, who is very uh, even-tempered and uh, very, a very calm presence at the White House. And the and the the Pentagon uh, under uh, former Senator Cohen is seems to be in the in the hands of pros. But this group of people uh, that is probably more experienced and, and talented than any that has been there since uh, the the start of the of the Clinton administration is not really running American policy. What has, what has developed is initiatives begun on Capitol Hill that uh, Clinton, under pressure from the same sorts of constituencies, will acquiesce to and uh, tr attempt to carry out in a, in a fashion that is a little bit weaker than Congress intended. The next week's visit by the Pope to Cuba highlights the most glaring example of, of what has isolated the United States from the, from the world. It's the 30-year economic embargo of Cuba that persists long after Cuba has ceased to become an, an agent of the Soviet Union in the Western Hemisphere. This is no longer just an eccentricity because the Helms-Burton legislation that was sponsored by uh, Congressman Dan Burton and, and Senator Helms has, holds the threat of imposing real penalties on the companies of foreign countries, not penalizing uh, their executives by denying them visas and penalizing them monetarily for holding property in Cuba. It reflects the uh, political power that a small but very noisy and prosperous group of Cuban exiles holes in Florida and New Jersey. Uh, 
Another annoyance to America's trading partners is the Iran-Libya Sanctions Act, which penalizes uh, companies that trade with Libya and Iran. It's ironic that just as the United States is thinking and wrestling with how to respond to the overture made in recent weeks by Iran's new president, the relatively moderate Hatami, it is also wrestling with the prospect of uh, penalizing the French energy company Total for a $2 billion investment in Iran's oil and gas, excuse me, oil development. The smart money in Washington says that an effort will be made between Washington and the Europeans to try to come to some kind of an accommodation that will avoid the prospect of very serious penalties. But some of the psychological damage has already been done. The United States is seen as attempting to punish other countries uh, for pursuing foreign policies that have failed to win support worldwide. Left to their own devices, I think a number of people in the administration would like to develop better ties with Cuba, and even more would like, would like to develop better ties with Iran. As Jeff mentioned, one, one reason is to balance the threat posed by Iraq. That's why there was such powerful interest last week inside the government over the CNN interview with Iran's president. People are getting tired of tr trying to maintain pressure on Iran at a time when its government appears to be, appears to be shifting even, ever so slightly. The other edge of the sword is, is a resentment felt at what appears to be American reluctance to share its own prosperity, its growing prosperity, with the rest of the world. Uh, the United States now spends, I th believe it's less than 1% of its budget on foreign aid. This is a proportion that has gone steadily downwards even since the Reagan years. We're more than a billion dollars in arrears to the United Nations. People up there still get, get paid and they can still heat the building, but the United States is starting to have less influence there than it than it had just a few just a few years ago. The, uh, we can we can see that quite clearly in the way that the UN Security Council is trying to deal with with Iraq, uh, and and this shows I, I think some of the um, some of the fallout and uh, potentially serious fallout from. America's relations with the rest of the world right, right at the moment. Uh, in the current standoff with the United Nations, there's, uh, I mean, between the United Nations and Iraq, there, there is more at stake than simply trying to t track down what m weapons of mass destruction Iraq has under development and what it, what it has hidden. What is also at stake for the United States is to maintain the pressure on Iraq, to keep it contained, to prevent it from becoming once again a threat to the region, which many in Washington believe would happen if Saddam Hussein were allowed to sell oil at will and allowed to rebuild his military. What the United States is faced with in New York, however, is an increasing desire on the part of France, Russia, and China to do business with Iraq and to attempt to find some way of easing the sanctions in the belief that Saddam Hussein eventually is going to rejoin the world and it's better to be to establish good relations with him and perhaps he 
will be civilized in the end. The um, policies towards Cuba, the policy to, uh, toward Iraq, and the, uh, the refusal to pay UN arrears, and uh, it, a halt in, in fast-track legisl legislation that would, that would um, enable greater free trade between the United States and the rest of the world, and the reduction in, in foreign aid all can be attributed to fairly narrow interests in the United States Congress, which nevertheless carry the day as, leg as legislation is voted because they are seldom a, an entire piece of legislation under themselves. They, are, they just form pieces of major budget le legislation. As a result, uh, a, a relatively small group of lawmakers can make quite an, make quite an impact. The one upshot is that even though the, there's almost worldwide an open canvas for the United States to explore new ideas and, and to pursue new policies that uh, might make the world a better place, might deal with the uh, important transnational problems of, of disease and, and pollution, migration, refugees, uh, and drugs. Um, these sort of creative policies are, have been stifled by more by constituent pressures on Capitol Hill. And without more money from Congress and an ability to mobilize international support, I think the United States is going to face real difficulty in dealing with future crises, in particular the, uh, the possibility of greater demand on the International Monetary Fund and other international financial agencies if the Asia financial crisis gets further out of control. Thank you. The defense correspondent beat has been a specialty of the sun for more than a half century. And most of you knew the late Charles Cordry, who did it so well and who was on this panel for so many years. Tom Bowman came to the sun in 1987, and he worked in our Anne Arundel County and Washington bureaus. And in those capacities, he covered the Naval Academy, he wrote a, uh, co-authored a notable series of articles in 1995 on the National Security Agency. He covered troubles at Aberdeen. And so uh, last April, when he was named defense correspondent, I think the general reaction was, gee, I thought he already was. <laughs> and without further ado, Tom Bowman. Thanks very much. Can you hear me? Is this good enough for the people by the kitchen? I was going to start out by saying that the Pentagon, as we head into a new year, is a lot like your average American. They're concerned about money, trying to get in better shape, and sex. <laughs> but I think the Pentagon is more concerned about sex than you folks are. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. <laughs> but there are other issues, certainly besides those three, that are at the forefront of the Pentagon's planning and thinking. Um, 
certainly the Korean situation is one which um, continues to trouble Pentagon planners. It seems to be something that's um, at least um, it's something they, they have their grips on, I think, at this point. The armored divisions and the soldiers there are probably some of the finest and most capable soldiers that we have. Uh, Haiti is another situation where we're going to see a lot of American troops here for quite some time. Um, uh, the, in Iraq is the same situation. We have two carrier groups here now. And uh, Tony Zinni, the Marine General there, says we're going to be sticking around the Gulf for, I would say, a few years, maybe waiting to see what happens to Saddam. Um, lastly, but hardly leastly, is, is Bosnia. We have 8,500 troops in Bosnia at this point, and um, Army General Wes Clark is going to be meeting next week with NATO commanders to try to figure out the next installment after June. They were supposed to all pull out in June, but as you know, that didn't happen, and I think it's going to be up to the Gore administration to uh, figure out what to do with this. <laughs> or maybe the McCain administration. <laughs> um, the talk is that they'll probably reduce the troops um, in Bosnia by maybe about 1,000 or so. Um, the folks in the Pentagon say, listen, we have to chop them down somewhat from the 8,500, or Congress isn't going to buy this. Um, so look for a slight reduction in the troops, I think, in Bosnia. Also this year, look for a greater effort, I think, perhaps in the, in the latter part of the year, to go after some of the war criminals. Um, I've been told by folks in the Pentagon that this is a, um, of great interest to uh, General Clark, and he's a man of his word. So I wouldn't be too surprised if um, in the middle of the night, we see some of these folks like Heritage um, heading off to The Hague. Um, what's interesting, I think, at the Pentagon is that um, it's a much more difficult world, certainly, than it was back in the glory days of the 80s. Uh, when we knew who our enemy was, it was the Soviet Union. We knew how to prepare to fight the Russians. Uh, now, as uh, CIA director, uh, the former CIA director Wolsey would like to say that the, the dragon is dead, but the plenty of snakes out in the turf. Um, and the other problem, there, there's that problem. There, there, are, uh, there are many enemies out there, uh, terrorists, um, uh, folks like Saddam that are going to continue in the coming years to be a headache, more so than a, than a, a serious threat. But um, what is particularly of concern to the Pentagon is that the budgets are being are stagnant and have been uh, for quite some time. Uh, I remember a quote from the former head of the National Security Agency. He told me that in the 1980s, they got so much money they couldn't even spend it. New buildings, new weapon, uh, listening devices, new systems. And he said it really took a, a concerted effort by folks at the NSA to actually spend this money. Well, the opposite is true now. The Pentagon is trying to struggle along with uh, between $250 billion and $260 billion a year. And you may say, well, hang on a second. That's a little bit of money. As Everett Dirksen used to say, a billion here, a billion there, we're, pretty soon we're talking real money. Um, but the, the problem that the Pentagon faces or a couple of things. Some of these um, uh, peacekeeping missions, humanitarian missions, are, are sapping their budgets, are sapping their personnel, and also their um, materiel. That's a problem for them. The other thing that, that's a problem for the Pentagon is they can't cut back on some of the things they would like to cut back on, um, namely bases. Um, and the problem certainly is Congress. Uh, it might be an old Indian fort to some folks, but to the congressman or the senator that has that fort, he'll be damned if you're going to close that on him. So Congress uh, has presented, uh, prevented uh, bases, uh, new rounds of base closings. 
Another thing that the, the military looked at was maybe cutting back on the Guard and the Reserve. Uh, here was another problem. The governors like the Guard and Reserve. They like naming the adjutant generals. They like having them around, if nothing else, than to fill sandbags and the, the rivers rise. So it's, it's difficult for the Pentagon to try to find some of these savings. And that's, some of the, that's the real challenge for Cohen, I think, in the coming year. A couple of things he's trying to do is to privatize a lot of the, the uh, support functions that are done at the Pentagon and the other is to cut back on staff. But um, besides the budget considerations, one of the, the serious problems, I think, for personnel um, in the Pentagon for the, the fighting men and women is that there's a concern that by being involved in some of these humanitarian missions and peacekeeping missions, even in the Gulf or in Bosnia, that they're losing their fighting edge that they're not out there training enough to how to f fight real battles. Um, this will be a, a particular concern, uh, I think, in congressional hearings in the early part of this year to see how we can get around that. And there are some in Congress who are saying that um, we have to get more troops to the national training centers to train to get to, to hone that, that fighting edge again. Um, but you see, these peacekeeping missions and the end of the Cold War also have a problem on retention and recruiting of, of military personnel. If you send a pilot to the Gulf and he's there for 11 months or a year, um, he may just decide to throw in his hat and go work for Delta Airlines where he can triple his money. And we're seeing a lot of that now at the Pentagon, the Air Force and the Navy are losing a tremendous number of pilots. Um, they've increased the um, their bonuses from 12,000 to 22,000, but at this point it doesn't seem to be working. Um, the same is true with um, folks on board ship, the fire control officers. Uh, a lot of them after long deployments are saying, you know, what, what am I doing this for? I'm away from my family for a year. Um, I can make much more money in a computer company. So the, the Pentagon is losing some of these seasoned war fighters, the pilots, the fire control officers, and it's something they're going to have to deal with in the future. And the same is true with recruiting. It was easy, I think, when we were fighting the Russian bear, it was easy to get people to sign up because we're fighting this serious foe. But how do you get someone to sign up when you say, we'll head down to Haiti and build a storm sewer? It's another serious problem for the military, is trying to recruit folks. Um, so one of the things we're seeing is they're, they're changing their, their ad campaign now. It's away from, it's not just a job, but it's, a, it's an adventure. Or it's not, uh, they'll have a tank rolling by and they'll say, earn $30,000 for college. They're trying to get away from that now and try to come up with ads that say, this will mold you into a kind of person that you, you want to be. It will teach you leadership skills that you'll have for the rest of your life. But they're still having, they've barely made the recruiting goals uh, for the past year, and it's going to be a serious problem, I think, for, for next year. Um, and that's it. Glad to answer any questions. Early in Kathy Lally's career, she was sitting on rewrite at the Akron Beacon Journal when a phone call came in, I believe with some agitation from the campus stringer at a nearby college. And as a result of that, Kathy and several of her colleagues at the Beacon Journal won the Pulitzer Prize for local reporting in 1971. Now that local story in northeastern Ohio was the Kent State University shooting, which was a seminal event in the nation's history and I think in Kathy's. Uh, she came to the paper, to the Sun a few years later, 
She's done a number of things, including been assistant managing editor. But she's here tonight because in 1991, the paper sent Kathy and her husband, Will England, to share the Moscow Bureau, and which they did through 1995, covering the rise of Yeltsin and the uh, end of the Soviet Union. Uh, the opening came up rather suddenly in that bureau again, and they asked to go back, which they did uh, in the middle of last year. The catch being that Will was engaged uh, then in the uh, investigation of the shipbreaking industry, and he couldn't really focus on Russia, and I think Kathy's about done it all for the past six months. Uh, He's there now, and uh, he will be back on that beat. But meanwhile, here is Kathy. <laughs> Russians love jokes, and jokes there are a particularly good barometer of life and politics. I particularly like one that a KGB officer told me. A nouveau riche Siberian um, drives into Red Square and parks his shiny new Cadillac um, right past St. Basil's next to the Kremlin gates where um, there's a lot of uh, local traffic in and out. Um, a policeman stops him and tells him, you can't park here. President Yeltsin drives by here. Prime Minister Chernomyrdin drives here. All the top government officials regularly drive by here. You better move this car or you're going to be really sorry. The Siberian looks at the policeman, pats his shoulder reassuringly, and says, don't worry, I locked it. <laughs> <laughs> Most Russians are completely cynical about their government. <laughs> They, um, they believe that the men at the top are stealing everything they possibly can. They have little faith in, in any institutions, whether banks or schools or hospitals or the police force. If you asked many Russians what their country was becoming, they probably would tell you it was becoming a cheap, morally bankrupt imitation of the West. In some ways, it's easy to agree with that. Uh, when, I when I returned to uh, Russia in August after being away from there for two years, I discovered that my closest Russian friends had all lost their life savings. Um, the, the savings that they had earned in just the few promising years after the fall of the Soviet Union. Irina, who is uh, a wonderful piano teacher and makes a decent living teaching foreigners, um, had lost her first round of savings in 1994 in one of those huge pyramid schemes that fleece thousands of people, but to this day has not led to any prosecutions. She then decided to put her money under the mattress, and about a year ago, somebody broke into her apartment and stole every penny. Another friend, Andre, who um, had served in a KGB, KGB prison for being a dissident, um, his crimes began when he showed too much of an interest in an international book fair in Moscow. Um, he began to save money um, when he began working as an interpreter for foreign journalists and um, took particular risks in Chechnya where he was re rather widely renowned for being um, careful and yet always in the right spot at the right time with his journalist in tow. Um, he saved about $19,000 that way and on a friend's recommendation invested it with a concert promoter whom he never saw again after, um, after the first few months. Um, Another friend, Liana, who works as an office manager and translator for an Australian business in Moscow, had also saved a decent sum. Um, but one night, her 20-year-old son was out with some friends, and they got into a fight with a, a bunch of drunken young men who turned out to be policemen. The next night, there was a knock on the door at 4 a.m., 
and uh, he was arrested, her son was arrested and thrown in jail. It cost her $8,000 in bribes to get him out. None of them thinks that there's any point in going to the police. Um, Russia is a country where people are routinely losing everything, where the police can't be trusted, where thousands of people haven't been paid for months, where the army is demoralized and so poorly paid that some soldiers have even starved to death. If this were any other country, you would expect angry mobs to be rioting in the streets. You'd expect perhaps a disgruntled colonel to tell his uh, men, okay, boys, here are the rifles. We've had enough of this. Let's take over. But logic has never been sufficient to explain Russia, and I don't think it does today. Despite what I've just described, my heart tells me to be optimistic about the future there that somehow Russia will stumble along. People have always been enduring and resilient there. They've never entirely relied on money or a paycheck. They rely on families and friends and connections. If your father isn't being paid, you take care of him. If your mother has a tiny pension, you help her out. You grow your cabbages and potatoes in the summertime, and they keep you alive in the winter. Um, they've also been inured to corruption. Um, the communist system was corrupt from top to bottom, and there's no particular reason to expect that a new political system would remove that impulse. Government leaders have always had fancy apartments and special stores where they could buy whatever they wanted when stores elsewhere were bare. So today the average person only uh, shrugs when the Prime Minister declares his income as $8,000 a year when it's widely believed that he became a billionaire in the privatization of the gas industry that he formerly oversaw. What I keep reminding myself is that the last few years have produced a truly amazing transformation in Russia. The crumbling of the Soviet Union could easily have produced civil war and chaos. They came very close to that in 1991 and 1993. It didn't happen either time. People kept going to work every day. They feed their children, they send them to school, they get married, they have babies. And while many, many are worse off than they were during the Soviet years, a growing number are slowly, slowly becoming better off. The streets of Moscow today, I was amazed on my return. They're full of, of foreign cars. When I first arrived there in 1991, um, foreign cars were only owned by foreigners, and after a while you pretty much knew who, who, which cars belonged to whom. Today, they're everywhere, and they all have Russian um, plates on them. New stores are opening every day, full of televisions, bicycles, jeans, washing machines, bread machines, cappuccino machines. All of this would have been completely unimaginable five years ago. Russia still has enormous tests ahead. Can it collect taxes and produce the stable revenue stream that it needs to become a real country? Can it create the kind of civic consciousness that will allow people to demand an end an end to corruption and hold politi politicians accountable? Can it create a society where individuals feel their actions have an effect? Can it persuade the U.S. to stop regarding it as a Cold War adversary and begin to treat it as a humbled superpower that can't bear too much more humiliation? Will the average person ever be able to stand up and be counted? When I ask myself these questions, I think of yet another friend, Nikolai, a struggling businessman who lost most of his savings last year when he was forced to pay extortion to the mafia. But he went right back to work. By last summer, he had saved up enough to take one of the popular cut-rate charter flights to Greece that are becoming more and more available to Russians. He showed me a picture of himself and several of his friends sailing on a boat along a, um, a Greek island. There I was, he says, a Russian, a Russian, and I was sailing along a Greek island completely free, free to go wherever I wanted, free. And I think if you had seen his face and, and heard his voice, you'd be optimistic about Russia, too. Thanks. Thank you.
Frank Langford came to the Sun in 1992 and he reported locally and in Annapolis and in Washington. And in uh, February, he was told to prepare to go to China. And in April, he was there. He, uh, he was in Hong Kong for the handover and he covered the uh, 15th Congress of the Communist Party. Uh, so he's still learning, but he's learned an awful lot, and here he is. Thank you. 1997 was a great year to go to China. It was the biggest uh, news year since 1989 and the Tiananmen Massacre. Um, so it's, uh, it's been quite a learning curve, but a, a great time to be there. I'd just like to talk about this year, where uh, the country seems to be now and where it, uh, it may or may not be going. Um, from the Chinese government perspective, 1997 uh, was an extraordinarily good year. All the preparation for the death of Deng Xiaoping paid off well last February when he finally died and uh, the leadership was able to move on and make its transition. Uh, President Jiang Zemin uh, took over formally um, and it went extremely smoothly. Um, in July, despite many concerns around the globe, the Hong Kong handover went smoothly also. Um, there were protests uh, and the police were very controlled and careful about how they handled it. And uh, China again came out looking pretty good, I think, in the uh, international spotlight. In the fall, uh, Jiang Zemin uh, led the 15th Party Congress, which is uh, the national convention that the Communist Party holds every five years he was able to oust one of his main rivals, uh, able to consolidate his power and push forward on uh, reforming the state-owned enterprises, which are one of the two major Achilles heels in China's economic transformation towards a market economy. Um, the year ended on an ominous note, the disastrous collapse of the currencies in Southeast Asia, uh, what some are now seeing as perhaps the the end of the Asian miracle, at least for the time being. And which brings us to the ongoing big story in China, and that is, is the economy. Um, since Deng Xiaoping opened up in 1978, the nation has embarked on this extraordinary experiment to shift China from a command to a market-oriented economy. And you can see it every day on the streets of Beijing and other cities. Um, there are people, uh, as Kathy describes, uh, driving Lexuses, Mercedes, young men in suits on cell phones, eating in Western restaurants, something that five, ten years ago was uh, a rarity in that city. Well, we all appreciate the uh, enormity of the experience and the expertise which has been with us tonight. Uh, we thank all of you for taking your time from what are extraordinarily busy days uh, to be with us. And we certainly thank the Baltimore Sun for making their wonderful foreign policy experts uh, available to us. Uh, so with gratitude, we thank you very much.